Welcome to Mysterious Goings On. We're going to get right to the show after these messages. Hi, this is Bunyet Ngene, author of The Bodies That Move, and you're listening to Mysterious Goings On. The intersection between history and fiction is one that has probably crossed a lot more than most readers imagined. And it's not a small thought to think about something I read that our guest wrote on his uh, webpage, where he said that most historians would probably admit that history and literature are closely related, sharing something of the same structures of plot, story, and the revelation of character. I couldn't agree more, and I want to explore that further as we speak with Dr. James Gilbert. He is the author of three novels and a book of short stories. In 2017, he won second prize, nothing wrong with that, in the F. Scott Fitzgerald Short Story Contest. Formerly, he was an American historian and author of 11 books, one of which was a New York Times notable book. He is currently at work on a mystery series set in Puerto Vallarta, Mexico, and also a novel set in Chicago in 1894. James Gilbert, welcome to Mysterious Goings On. I'm delighted to be here. Delighted to have you. I have a connection... Uh, with historians, uh, besides the fact that I am an amateur student of history, my grandfather, who wrote Westerns for 50 years, was also an historian by trade. And uh, I am always overjoyed to meet an historian, especially one as celebrated as yourself, who has crossed over and written fiction. Has this been something that has kind of figuratively nipped at your heels throughout your life, or is it a relatively new development? Uh, I think I would say I, I kind of edged over into it. Uh, uh, the, uh, uh, I, I ran up against a problem uh, when I wrote the book that got the notable book award. I, I ran into a problem. It was about the Chicago World's Fair. And, uh, and I ran into a problem of trying to figure out what people actually saw and did rather than what historians have, have said was important about the fair. Well, those are two very different things. And, um, and then I wrote, uh, much later, I wrote another book on the St. Louis World's Fair of 1904, which is the biggest, in terms of size, was the biggest World's Fair uh, in history. And, uh, and, I, and, I, and I ran up against the same problem. What in the world did people do when they got there? Did they go to all of the exhibits that they were supposed to go to? Uh, or did they just have fun? And how do you how do you figure that out? And I realized that that you couldn't figure it out as a historian, that you could only imagine what they did from bits and pieces of things that people would say. Um, and and I and I and and in this book I I ended the book by saying essentially Historians can only get half the story, uh, and uh, and I kind of threw my hands up and said, "I'm going to try something else, uh, and I want to get on the inside of characters. I want to see what characters really thought and what they believed. And the only way to do that is to imagine it." Yeah, you know, uh, it's interesting you mentioned the Chicago World's Fair. I, the only thing I'd written or read about that previously was, of course, Eric Larson's Devil in the White City, uh, which tackled it rather well himself as, 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 as did you, have you read that one? Did you oh, have any sure. thoughts? On that? Yeah. Yeah. And he read my book, uh, as a, as it, it's in the back where he, where he thanks people. Oh, nice. Very nice. <laughs> <Careful there. laughs> did, did you, did you, did you find though that trying to, to inhabit these characters was, was that a, a more of an excavation process or was it more of, of one, uh, when I say that I'm looking into yourself and how, if you were say somebody living in that time, or was it, was it a different way of getting to that character? Well, I'll tell you, I, I know a great deal about the 1890s and that period between the civil war and the great influenza 
uh, uh, plague of 1918, which is when the stories take place. And I know a lot about it. So I didn't, uh, although I did a lot of research at the same time. I, you know, once you're a historian, you can't stop doing research. It's, yeah. it's in the blood. And, uh, and I did a lot of photographic research. Uh, just just assembling pictures of the little town that I was writing about, or little towns like it, uh, and then I uh, then I found that constructing the characters was amazingly easy. Uh, that uh, that I, I developed a, a kind of a hook for each story. Uh, each each individual story has a has a a, a kind of a of a snap ending or a, uh, an ironic ending or something of that sort. And once I had figured that, that out, uh, the character just became real to me and I inhabited that character. Uh, whether it was a woman or a man or a child or uh, uh, an immigrant or a, a, a black woman, uh, all of those characters became so real to me that I thought I was, when I was writing them, that I really thought I was that person. Here's a question for you. Uh, I, I, I write myself, and do, do you miss them when you're done with the book? Well, I do go back to them, <laughs> and I think about them. <laughs> but <laughs> one of the things that I, that, I, uh, that I always do is to try to figure out who my favorite character is. And, uh, and, and sometimes, sometimes that changes. Uh, because I revisit them and I think about them again. Uh, uh, and in a, in a way, I regretted finishing the book because it was such an adventure into the minds and hearts of these people uh, that I, I hesitated to put it down. Well, I'm sure that's how your readers feel too. <laughs> well, I hope so. <laughs> so the book we're talking, we're talking about Tales of Little Egypt. Tell us Tell, tell us all about that. Where, where does this come from? It's based on a real place. Uh, just give us the, 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 the setting and all that, if you would. Okay, fine. Uh, Little Egypt is uh, the area of Southern Illinois that is uh, uh, right between the Mississippi River and the Ohio River, where they come together at the tip of Illinois. And it's called Little Egypt because it's like a river delta in the same way that Egypt is the river delta. And the, the, in, the, in the 1890s and around the turn of the century, the main town was Cairo, uh, which is a city on the Mississippi. Now, it's not pronounced Cairo down there. It's called Cairo, <laughs> naturally. <laughs> naturally. <laughs> and, and I was... I was drawn to I was drawn to that area for a couple of reasons, uh, partly because it's it's such a crossroads of America. It's not it's not really the east east or the west, and it's certainly not the north or the south. It's got it's got uh, elements of all parts of America in it, and it seemed to me that it was a kind of quintessential area that one would want to write about. So some of the characters so. One of the things I do in the in the book is talk about how people arrive at Marion, where they come from, and how they end up in such a place. And so I have one person from uh, uh, the battlefield of of the Civil War, uh, one person from uh, St. Louis, which is the major city in that area, uh, one person from Baltimore, uh, somebody from Italy. Uh, so there's a there's a uh, an exploration of where they come from and why they end up there. Now, you're a Chicago native, correct? Yes. So has this, had this been an area you had uh, spent any time in in your youth or? Absolutely. Uh, my uh, Both sides of my family come from, from Southern Illinois. And uh, I spent every summer as a child, I spent every summer, a couple of weeks maybe, maybe a little bit longer, traipsing around and visiting one old aunt and one old uncle after another. <laughs> and it was, it was, it was, uh, my, my family's been there for uh, both sides for a hundred years. Uh, so uh, we're deeply enmeshed in that, uh, in, in that place. If I could just have a quick aside for you, uh, 
before we get, I want to get back to the book for in a moment, but I, I, I forgot to ask you this initially though. You, you're an, a historian, you d distinguished career as an historian. What attracted you to being an historian in the first place? I, you know, I fell into it. <laughs> I just fell into it. I was uh, uh, at, at my college, I was an English major. Uh, and I, uh, and at my senior year, I became interested in, in, in American studies. And so I wrote a thesis on American studies and I got, uh, and I, and so I, I decided to go to graduate school in American studies, which is really literature and history together. Hmm. Uh, and, uh, and when I got to the university of Wisconsin, which is where I did my graduate work, uh, uh, I joined the long line of graduate students uh, waiting to see the head of the department. And when I finally got there, he looked at me and he said, Gilbert, there is no such thing as American studies. You're in history. <laughs> <laughs> so there I was. <laughs> but I loved it. I really came to love it. Well, American history is it's such a, a, a rich tapestry and the, the good news too it's only about 400 years long so you don't have to <laughs> yes but you can't know everything that's for sure <laughs> that is true that is true you know so the back to tales of little egypt i appreciate you sharing that with me but back to the book so the period in which it's set from uh, around the civil war all the way up to the pandemic of 1918 which basically concludes right around the time the world war one concludes there is i'm you know can't help but see parallels to today um can you can you kind of give us some some uh, thought about the parallels that you maybe put in there and maybe some of the parallels that just surprised you when you after you wrote it well uh, what surprised me most of all was the pandemic of uh, 2020 because I wrote, finished the book uh, uh, way before the uh, the pandemic struck here uh, the contemporary pandemic so I thought oh my god I predicted it, <laughs> but um, the reason I the reason I, I end I end with that with the story about um, a, uh, uh, a a veteran from the from World War One who came who came back to uh, Marion, Illinois, uh, in 1918, and he had been gassed during the during the uh, war, which was very typical. And uh, and he and he contracted influenza, uh, and he and uh, and so the story is about the woman he he's courting and 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 how she deals with what happens to him. But I will tell you that uh, several of my uh, ancestors died of the influenza plague, and so it was on my mind when I came to write that story. Do you feel that Americans uh, have uh, a bit of a amnesiac or just, well, I, I don't want to use the word ignorant, but I, I just did there, about history, about our own history? Because it what, what perplexed me the most, uh, Jim, about 2020 pandemic versus, you know, 1919, 1918, it, it's all right there. I mean, I, I knew about it. I had studied it. I understood it. Um, I think it helped me stay a little calmer than I probably would have otherwise. But I, I can't tell you that I ran into terribly too many people, whether in person or on the internet, who seemed to have any kind of idea that this had happened before and actually was just horrific worldwide. Is uh, Thoughts on that? Yeah, I, I have to say that despite all of the talk and chatter about American history, uh, that very few people know anything at all about it. Um, you know, there have been surveys done endlessly about how many people know uh, who the pre any of the important presidents were or what the First Ten Amendments are or what the Constitution says or when the Civil War occurred or what or, or that there was a World War I before World War II. Uh, and and it's, it's, a, it's a never ending struggle. And I, I, I will say that I don't think that most Americans learn history from historians or from taking history courses. I think they learn it from what politicians say. I think they learn it from museums sometimes. They learn it from uh, historic 
uh, areas like battlegrounds and like Gettysburg and things like that. And they learn it from reenactments of history of which there are stories uh, all the way from New England to the Middle West uh, and to the West. Uh, they learn it from movies, uh, but historians have very little say over what uh, people actually learn, uh, even um, uh, partly because history is no longer a required course in, in most places. Uh, uh, and uh, even when even when they were, I don't think they learned very much. I have to say, uh, yeah, you know, uh, I one of my uh, personal projects is uh, is to try to get civics at the very least be mandatory back in schools. It's something I work on on the side, and uh, uh, I, I I fear it's a, it's going to be a losing battle. But I, I keep doing it if, during lockdown. My, I have a twelve year old daughter. I bought a curriculum. So we taught, uh -huh. I taught her civics once a week. Uh, okay. And well, I, she's an interested person and those young minds are just soaking things up, you know, and it was an opportunity for also for me as a father, as a parent to bond with her. But I got to teach her like, and refresh my own memory and understanding the constitution, understand how it created, talking about the golden triangle, talking about all these issues, uh, what, how America's, what America is based on to a large degree, good and bad. So I, I, I love talking to historians and getting perspective on that. It must be frustrating for you in that regard that they don't come to historians to get uh, get that knowledge or get that that learning because uh, relying on popular culture, let's face it, for our, our historical <laughs> understanding is probably not always a very good idea. It can be a little bleak. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> you are so diplomatic, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> Bleak. <laughs> uh, it's that old Santayana quote, right? I don't know. That's probably overdone about, you know, mistakes and repeating themselves that we don't know. But I don't know. I mean, I, it, to me, the, the, the bookends between these two pandemics, it just seems a natural thought. Uh, I just think if, if more people had understood what happened 100 years ago, we would have been so much better prepared. Well, I, th I, I think so, you know, and, and the thing about the pandemic of, of 1918 was uh, that the victims were, were different. Uh, the victims tended to be young. Uh, and, uh, you know, it started, I'm not sure where it started. They call it the Spanish flu. So Kansas, maybe, right? it's, maybe it's from one of the Spanish colonies uh, that got translated into Spain uh, in, in 1917, 18, and, and just kind of spread without anybody really realizing what it was. But um, it, it was most virulent on the, on the battlefront. And uh, there, were, there were scores and scores of casualties, people who died of the, of the, of the influenza uh, plague on the battlefield. And, and, um, and I, probably, uh, there's no doubt that the, that the virus mutated as it swept around, uh, uh, these uh, uh, actually uh, healthy but but weakened people uh, fighting on the fighting on the on the front lines, and then what happened was they brought it back. Uh, they all came back, and they all brought the plague with them. And so the the soldiers were the great spreaders of this plague. And and I'll say one other thing about it: there was nothing that anybody knew what to do. Not at all. Uh, uh, people in those days cured fever by uh, by freezing you, <laughs> uh, which may or may not have been effective. But uh, but there were no drugs. Uh, there was uh, there was no vaccine, and it just simply died out after everybody acquired immunity to it. True herd immunity. Yes, but it killed millions of people. Yeah. And it's it's interesting, and I, I sorry to go off on the sidebar on this, but I just I think it's very timely to discuss for a moment. It's just that uh, uh, today, since we have vaccines for the flu every year, so you know some years more effective than others, but by and large, and we people still do die in great numbers from the flu worldwide. But it's not it's more it's more commonplace than than uh, but obviously it was a hundred years ago. Um, but it's just it's just to me it's just. It's terrifying, though, the idea that these uh, these viruses are just out there lurking, and that the, if they can make the jump, you, you know, right. and, and they choose 
they choose their own time. Yeah, indeed. Uh, well, let's get back to the the book here. I'm I'm curious though. Again, we, I'd ask you a little bit about this earlier about uh, going from from uh, from history to fiction. I just my grand my own grandfather uh, who was a historian. He was not a PhD, but he was uh, an Air Force historian um, for about thirty years and a teacher. He when he wrote the westerns, he just loved. The genre he liked writing westerns. He he uh -huh. started in the he started in the pulps and you know went on from the forties all the way up till he retired and passed away in the late nineties. Um, but uh, he just loved that section that that piece of the pie that was the old west and whether it was a greatly uh, exaggerated uh, myth, which I think to a large degree was. He loved it and thrived in that. Uh, but your your books are and your stories are tending in this this area more often than not. Correct that you've already that you've carved out with uh, uh, with tales of Little Egypt. Is that about right, or did I get that wrong? Yeah, uh, I mean, as a historian, I wrote uh, I wrote uh, three books on world fairs. Uh, right. One on St. Louis, one on Chicago, and one on Seattle. Uh, but uh, but I. But I, I, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm immensely attracted to Chicago as a phenomenon. I think it's a, uh, it's an amazing city, and uh, and I've just completed a novel about uh, a, a young, a young boy from upstate New York who, who goes to Chicago to seek his fortune, and uh, gets a job at Marshall Fields, uh, and uh, and. It, it's it's kind of a tragedy, but there's it's not a there's not a murder or anything in it. But but it's a it's a it's really a story about what the what what that movement to the city is really all about and why people did it and what what they faced when they got there. Uh, I, I will say that I will say that one of the things that 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 uh, I discovered when I was writing about Chicago. Uh, in the 1890s and at the turn of the century, when I did the book on on the Chicago World's Fair, I discovered that almost every one of the great uh, builders of Chicago came from uh, from upstate New York. Uh, and and you, if you think about it, it's a straight migration across the lakes, yeah, to Chicago. And these were people who were uh, who were deeply imbued with a kind of 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 um, evangelical religion uh, much as much as they are today and and a kind of a success myth and they built the city out of uh, basically nothing uh, uh, it, it the, the story of Chicago is just an amazing story uh, it in 1833 when it was founded I believe it had 30,000 people uh, before that it was an Indian village and by uh, by the turn of the century it had over a million people uh, and, and every every decade it gained five to six hundred thousand new inhabitants. So it's just uh, this is a, the the period of the tales of Little Egypt is really an interesting period because it's the time when all of the great American cities except except maybe Los Angeles uh, were were created. You know, Cleveland, St. Louis, Baltimore, uh, Chicago. Uh, 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 Detroit and Pittsburgh and so on. All the great kind of industrial cities were built at that time. And at the same time, as people were rushing into the city, they were thinking about how much they were missing from their small town life. And that's what intrigues me. And that's why I wrote Tales of Little Egypt. It's about those people who stayed or who went to the little town and created the little town that we now think of as the real America. So it's a, it's you, a very interesting period where you get this uh, amazing dichotomy between these mammoth uh, exploding cities and a little town stringing up all over the place uh, that we now think of as, oh, gee, that's where we come from. That's the real America. Uh, the cities are false, they're fake, they're, they're full of illusions and so on. Do you, but are you also looking back at your own life a little bit? Uh, did I read something about shaking off the parochial uh, upbringing and, and when you moved on and, and into the, the world of adulthood? 
I, su I suppose so. I grew up in a suburb of, Ch of, of Chicago. So I always thought of Chicago as the, this wonderful place, mystical place with the, all these fabulous museums and uh, 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 musical venues and nightclubs. And when well, I got old enough, and uh, and a place of experiment and change and growth and so on. And I thought of my uh, my my little suburb as, oh my God, I couldn't live here if I had to. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm not I'm not nostalgic for my town, but uh, but I do understand that nostalgia a lot. I I really think I I get it. What is it about Chicago? What what does Chicago have that New York City doesn't? And I know I'm asking a native, okay? So indulge yourself. But what what is it? Because I'll just take beyond beyond pizza, please. Uh, uh, and I hate to say this because I love Chicago, but I prefer the Brooklyn style. But the point being, what is it that Chicago has that that New York City doesn't? I I think it's uh, uh, I think it's a delusion of grandeur. And uh, and and I think and I think that that delusion is an aesthetic, uh, and it and it went into the building of Chicago and the architecture of Chicago and the planning of, of Chicago and the way uh, people talk about it and the way they conceptualize it and so forth. All the while knowing that New York is miles ahead of them in terms of population and culture and everything else, but it's uh, to me uh, delusion can be an aesthetic. I I I am far from disappointed by that answer. That's the most interesting, unusual answer I thought I I could ever get about that. I never would have dreamt to even think of it in those terms. Um, do, do you do you feel though that, that Chicago denizens, for want of a better word, uh, feel do, because it seems like I'm from Chicago. You see, you didn't even name you didn't name the suburb where you grew up. If you're from New York, I don't know if you say you're from New York. I'm from Queens. I'm from Brooklyn. Right, I'm from the right. the borough. Right? Is is that a correct assumption or, or what do you yeah, think? Yeah, that's that that's absolutely true because I think New Yorkers identify. Uh, I very identify very strongly with the with the borough there they come from. Uh, all of them, however, radiating around the sun of of Manhattan. Manhattan, yeah. Uh, but uh, but but uh, I think I've I've met a lot of people uh, uh, from the suburb suburbs of Chicago, and they always say I'm from Chicago. Me too. So so the identity of the suburbs is enmeshed in. Uh, in the in the vision of Chicago. Let me take you. To, uh, we have a fair number of writers who listen to the show. I would love to, if it's okay, to ask you a couple of writerly questions, if that's sure. all right. Uh, tell me, what's the difference between your actual day to day writing schedule, your process, your whatever it is that you you do? Is there a difference when you're writing a book of um, uh, a fiction uh, and an historical work. Do you see what I'm saying? Is there is there a different way you approach the the keyboard, or do you do you write them out? How does it look? Uh, I, I I I write I write two ways uh, for fiction, and I, I I wrote a very different way for for history. Uh, I write uh, in the morning when I'm writing fiction. I'm I'm like Hemingway without the without the alcohol. <laughs> <laughs> And of course, without the great, you know, without I'm not. I don't mean to compare myself. But, <laughs> okay. but he wrote every morning, uh, and yeah. I and I do that too. Uh, the second place I write, and and this is something that 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 I don't like this, but but I but I have to do it. Uh, I write in bed. Uh, uh, it something always occurs to me. When I just before I go to sleep, and I have a notebook next to my bed, and I write myself a note, and then the, the next morning I try to figure out whether it's worth worth keeping or not. Uh, but uh, but I think I think that's because when I relax, the stories that I've embedded in my mind come forward, and I see the characters, and I hear their talk. And I uh, look at the descriptions that I've written about where they are, and all of those things 
uh, are suggestive. And I, and I almost always write myself a little note saying, fix this, you know, this is a good sentence. Oh, I didn't realize uh, this will be great here and so forth. So I, I write two ways. Now, in terms of history, I used to write all day. Uh, I, I mean, not 24 hours or anything like that, but any time during the day. Because uh, because I was employed as a as a professor, I had to squeeze out time, uh, and I and my classes were almost always in the morning, so I would write sometimes in the afternoon when I got home or at night, uh, and so forth. So it's a very different schedule when you're employed, and since I'm not employed anymore, <laughs> uh, I, I I I have the luxury of writing in the morning. Yeah, it's interesting the two muscles. I mean, I write fiction, but uh, by, but I'm also a public relations uh, consultant, and I do a lot of copywriting by nature of that work. For example, after you and I conclude our discussion, which I'm really enjoying, I have to switch off that side of my brain and write a press release, which is, <laughs> okay. ugh, you know. But sorry, uh, clients, if you're actually listening, I doubt they are. Uh, but but uh, it's a different muscle. It's a different vibe. I'm with you. I seem to write best in the morning for fiction. Um, I, I I think the as the day wears on, something happens to me, my consciousness. I think the day filters in in a way that doesn't help me. I like to be fresh and I like to hit it. Though, your point about getting in bed uh, with stuff, I will find, I, I, and I've not had a lot of other writers tell me this, some have, but not all, that I find myself, I think especially when I'm in the midst of work, working on a book, that I'll dream about the characters a little bit. Yes. Yes, that happens too. Um or, 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 or I dream a story that's similar to something I'm writing. Mm. What's the most rewarding aspect of writing for you? Oh, uh, dear, I'm not, you know, I think, I think it's really figuring something out. Uh, every, every time you write something, it's a puzzle. Uh, you have to figure out who the character is how the character expresses him or herself, uh, and what the story is, uh, and and uh, and I and I find that I find that that uh, when I write a story, uh, or even a novel, I have the ending in mind before I even begin it, because I and 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 the and the journey of getting to that ending is what is so pleasing. I, I'm similar. I, I generally have a good idea how it's going to end up. Only of one or two books have I had that last sentence in mind at the beginning, you know? But getting to that is such a wonderful trip. I think I, I love how you express that because it is like uh, solving a problem or a puzzle, isn't it? To try to to try to make sure all the pieces fit. Right. And um, and, and the other thing that's the other thing that I I uh, I, I really uh, think is a great puzzle is is trying to remember uh, uh, what you've said in the, in the past now that's not so that's not so difficult on a short story you just go back right. and look but but um, but you have to I, I really like going back and and reaffirming oh yes that character I, I I'm still in character I still um, I still am saying the same things that she said earlier. Uh, and the speech is the same, and the aspect, is, the uh, affect is the same. That's that's also a lot of fun. What, what do you think the the what do you think the direction is going for historical fiction, just in general? Let's, if you don't mind, just taking it out of the creative side, just talking about the the industry for a moment. Where do, what, where do you see it going? What do you think's happening? Is the market just as vibrant as it always has been? Uh, I'm thinking of the days of Herman Woke, when man, those big thick airport paperbacks, uh, winds of war. You remember those? Uh, yeah. what, how do you feel about that? Well, you know, the, the, uh, I, I'm glad you mentioned that that particular book because because the historical fiction of around World War II is just endless. Uh, and it just keeps churning out and as if we've never heard that story before and we need to hear it again. <laughs> uh, I, I think it's... I, I think it's a little bit like uh, it's, it's a little bit like um, I, I, I want to know about evil. 
uh, because I don't see it in my daily life. I want to know. I want to. I want to see what human beings are really capable of doing, and I, I and I love to be horrified. So that kind of that kind of, of historical literature is is endless. I think there's a lot of uh, a huge amount of civil war uh, historical literature. Uh, there's also a lot of biography of great men, uh, bio, which is, I guess, historical literature of a sort. Uh, you know, and those are the great big, you know, you get a huge book <laughs> about Teddy Roosevelt. Oh, my God. If I ever have to see another book about Teddy Roosevelt, I'm going to die. <laughs> but uh, so there's all that kind of stuff. Yeah. Uh, uh, I think I think what what I've written is 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 really very different from that. It's not about people that you know. It's about people that you don't know, but who are familiar, um, and they live in a particular historical setting. And so the the uh, that kind of historical literature, I think, is 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 kind of unusual. Um, and it's not it's not writing about Marie Antoinette. Or Robespierre, or you know, one of the war horse stories, uh, but is writing about uh, uh, it's really fiction, which happens to be set in history, and so I it's it's actually belongs to two modes. One is historical literature, and the other is is literary literature. So it, it, it and I'm not sure that a lot of the Hitler stuff belongs in both categories. <laughs> I, I think the I love your 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 discussion of uh, the metaphor about evil. Well, I mean, if you want the personification of all those horrible things, Nazi. There you go. That's it. Right. right? It's right there. Um, that's that fascinates me. I love that. Yeah, my my own grandfather. He 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 was really good about being historically accurate. He was very serious about that. Uh, the Hanging Judge in little you know in little uh, Fort Smith. Uh, Arkansas. Uh, he always had him in court, you know, and, and had really researched how he conducted his court, that kind of thing. I always appreciated that. Um, but it was, as you said, he was uh, bringing in his own people and putting them in the milieu of, of real historical events, which is what right. you're doing here, which I agree, because when I first read about what you're doing, I said, well, this is you ready for me to say this? Don't don't throw anything at me through the screen, uh, Jim. But I thought, well, this isn't historical fiction, and I didn't mean it in a sneering way. I said, this is literary fiction. This is this is right. the mainstream stuff here. Um, well, I so think I, it is actually. Yes, it's, it's both. Yeah, I think it is. All right, I in the the fleeting moments we have left, I've so enjoyed this. I can't believe the time has gone so fast. Uh, as a mystery writer myself, gotta ask, tell me about this. What is this uh, series you're setting in Puerto Vallarta? What's going on with that? Ah, well, this is, uh, first of all, Puerto Vallarta is a place where I have been lots of times. And uh, and I decided I would uh, write a, a series of novels about about this, about, about the city. And uh, the sleuth the, is amateur, uh, an amateur uh, detective, obviously, is a, a woman uh, who is the uh, council general representing the United States uh, in, in Puerto Vallarta. And so she gets involved in, in any time uh, an American is murdered. Okay. Uh, and she becomes the detective. And uh, I've really enjoyed writing those. I've written, I've written three. One has been published and two are, are about to be published. Uh, uh, and uh, and I, I, I really like this character. She's a uh, She's a, uh, I will say, I know a lot about the State Department. I, I spent one summer uh, working for the State Department uh, in their promotions department. And I read five, five or 6,000 uh, uh, CVs. And I really got to know what the hell the, the Foreign Service is all about. I really knew uh, it, it was more than I ever wanted to know about the Foreign Service. Uh, and I thought, you know, given that I know about this exotic place uh, and that I know about this exotic, this is a, a kind of exotic uh, uh, detective. I mean, very unusual. She's just a bureaucrat. And, you know, all she does is stamp visas all day and, and uh, you know, deal with the, 
uh, deal with people who want to open a franchise or something like that. But uh, but I, um, I I I thought, my God, that would be interesting if she has to get involved, and she's reluctant. She doesn't like it, uh, uh, and uh, she she keeps getting dragged into into uh, into these murder mysteries uh, in spite of herself. Because anytime somebody an American dies, everybody says, "All right, uh, you're responsible." You're the you're the only representative of the United States in that city, and so what are you going to do about it? Uh, and I and I think it's a great it's a great um, idea uh, for a for a series of novels. Uh, that's what I do with mine. It's he's not a real detective. He's just he's actually a college professor. Gets dragged into mysterious situations. I, <laughs> it's it's worked so far. Uh, what you didn't tell me? What's the name of that book that's out? Uh, the first in the series. The first one is called Zona Romantica. Ooh. It's, it's a uh, uh, it means the romantic zone. It's a part of of uh, Puerto Vallarta. I like it. I like and it a lot. It's about uh, the story. I think you would love this story. It's about a uh, a failed American writer who who lives in uh, in Puerto Vallarta, and uh, and he's kidnapped, and uh, and so my main character has to find him. Uh, but there's a lot of complications, and a lot of it has to do. A lot of the, the of the mystery has to do with writing, and what hap what happens to a writer, uh, and, and a writer's career. But I can't tell you any more because that would spoil the movie or uh, the, the uh, story for you. <laughs> you know, I've regular listeners will hear me say this uh, when I have a particularly interesting guest, and I'll say thanks a lot. You've just added to the stack on my bedside table, but that's okay. <laughs> I, uh, I've, I've look, I'm always up for a particularly new mystery, but but also as as a fan of Chicago and as a fan of U.S. history, um, I'm glad to have met you and learned more about what you're doing. I think uh, I think I'm going to be reading a lot more of uh, of Dr. Gilbert's work here in the future. Thanks so much. It was great to talk to you. You too, folks. The in the show notes, I have just so you don't have to hunt him down i have a link to his website it is james gilbert author.com you'll find that there he's also got a facebook page which you can uh, go follow him there and again the book is the latest is tales of little egypt you're going to want to check this one out and again we want to thank jim for being here on mysterious goings on thank you again You know, I love podcasting. I have since 2006, back when you had to use like a Dixie cup with string to make the thing work. And that's why I'm so excited that we recently moved Mysterious Goings On to Anchor FM to record our podcast. I got to tell you, I don't regret it a bit. If you haven't heard about Anchor, it's the easiest way to make a podcast. Let me explain. First of all, it's free. There's creation tools that allow you to record and edit your podcast right from your phone or computer. Anchor will distribute your podcast for you so it can be heard on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and many more. And you can make money from your podcast with no minimum listenership. It's everything you need to make a podcast all in one place. I'm not going to lie to you, when I first heard about Anchor, I was a little dubious because I've been doing it the hard way for so long. But I got to tell you, it's very easy. Use a Stripe account get sponsors you're not paying monthly hosting fees the sound quality is great the distribution is phenomenal friends download the free anchor app today if you want to start your own podcast or go to anchor.fm to get started remember you heard it here first on mysterious goings on Thanks so much for listening to Mysterious Goings On. Don't forget we have a complete archive of all of our interviews, monologues, updates, live readings, dead readings. All of that stuff is available at mgopod.com. And of course, don't forget to subscribe to us so you never miss an episode. We're on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, all the usual suspects. Please join us there. Again, don't forget, mgopod.com also has links where to find me on social media and how to get in touch in case you want to be a guest here on the show. Well, I think it's time that I move on for this week, but until next time, keep reading.